It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of Official Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Day after day, this Premier is making decisions that make life harder and more expensive for working families and for the most vulnerable people in our communities, slashing the social assistance increase and cancelling the basic income pilot doesn't help people. It keeps folks trapped in poverty. Why is this Premier cutting supports that the most vulnerable families depend upon? Premier. Well, through you, Mr. Speaker, it's funny how the Leader of the Opposition has come down here day after day after day talking about the Win Liberal legacy that she propped it up for 15 years. That put us in debt $340 billion, the highest taxes in Canada, the highest hydro rates anywhere in North America. Continues, Mr. Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition continues day after day telling the people of Ontario how she wants to have the highest carbon taxes mm -hmm. anywhere in Canada, the highest gas prices anywhere in Canada. Talk about taking care of the most needy. That's not part of what she really believes in. She believes in raising taxes because the people on social assistance, Mr. Speaker, the people on social assistance, they actually pay energy costs. I met with Elsie yesterday in Belleville, and on her check, thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, I can I can tell you what's not funny, and that's the wrong-headed priorities of this premier. That's what's not funny. I'm incredibly worried about what this Premier's cuts mean to the most vulnerable people across Ontario. Cutting social assistance and cancelling basic income pilot means that more people come to order. will be forced to go to food banks. More people will be at risk of homelessness, and more people will struggle to survive. Mr. Transportation will come to order. More people will struggle to survive in dire poverty. As of Monday, 15,000 people have signed a petition calling on this Premier to reverse course and save the basic income pilot project, like he promised to do during the campaign speaker. Will this Premier listen, or will he continue to hurt the lowest income people in Ontario? Thank you. Premier. Well, through you, Mr. Speaker, I'll carry on about Elsie. I met Elsie in Belleville, and Elsie's on social assistance. She showed me her paycheck, and there was $139 energy cost. I told her that we're going to increase her payments by 1.5%. And then, and then I told Elsie, what's 12% of $139? We came up with we came up with a figure that's actually higher than 1.5 percent. We came up with a, a figure that's higher than 1.5 percent. And then Elsie, Elsie had a car outside, and guess what? I told Elsie that her gas prices, once we scrap the cap and trade, is going down 10 cents per liter. So once. So once I explained it to Elsie. That if you add up everything that the cost. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Final supplementary. Stop the clock. Restart the clock. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, I'm incredibly proud to welcome almost 30 people from my city of Hamilton who are participating in the Basic uh, Income Pilot Project, and they're here with their families, friends, and local advocates. And they're here with one message for the Premier of this province: slashing social assistance and cancelling basic income is absolutely the wrong thing to do, because it hurts Mr. thousands Children, of people and social across Ontario. In fact, it's, it's bullying the most vulnerable Mr. people Tourism in our province. Order. How can this Premier look people in the eye and rip away the supports that these folks need to get out of poverty and get their lives back on track? Premier. 
For, for you, Mr. Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition is using the same math as she did during the election. You know, skewing the numbers of $5 billion. Well, let me tell the people on social assistance that there's gonna have, they're going to have a 1.5% increase. Here, here. They're going to have lower energy costs. Here, here. They're going to have lower gas costs. Here, here. And my friends, do you know what? They want more than anything. They want a good paying job. Yeah. And we're going to provide them with a good paying job. We're going to get the economy booming once again here in Ontario until less people are on social assistance. Because in the last 15 years, Mr. Speaker, people on social assistance has increased 55 per cent. The basic guaranteed income program Response. that the Leader of the Opposition is talking about would cost the province $17 billion. But I know the Leader of the Opposition thinks money grows on trees down here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Premier. Take your seat, please. Please take your seat. Restart the clock. Next question. Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you so much, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier, uh, whose government, last time they were in office, reduced social assistance by almost 23 per cent, right. driving people into the deepest poverty that we've seen in this province over the last 15 the years. Government will come to order. Fix it, uh, Speaker. So today we have somebody from Hamilton named Tim with us, and here's what basic income means to Tim. It means he can finally buy healthy food. He can finally afford to to take the bus to get to his doctor's appointments. He can finally save up first and last month's rent so that he can actually find housing that's safe, clean, and where he doesn't have to live in fear. Speaker, Why is this Premier ripping basic income away from Tim and hundreds of people like him? Premier. Through, through you, Mr. Speaker, we're going to make Tim and people like Tim have a better life. Because we're going to increase their assistance by 1.5 percent. Again, we're going to lower Tim's energy costs by 12 percent. And if Tim drives a car or any of Tim's friends, for Waterloo, will come to order. My friend, it's amazing how they're out of tune. Elsie drove a car. Elsie drove a car, and a lot of people drive a car that's on social assistance. They got to put gas in their tank just like you. And if it was up, Mr. Speaker, it was up to the leader of the opposition, she'd have the highest gas prices in North America. Let's not forget the leader of the opposition sat down here for years and years propping up the wind liberals, propping up the high carbon tax, propping up high taxes, yep. propping up high gas prices. Tax, tax, tax. Spend Thank you. Stop the clock. Members of please take your seat. House will come to order. Start the clock. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Well, Tim is not alone. Every one of the basic income participants here today has a story about how basic income has helped improve their lives. Many of these stories are being published in news uh, sources across uh, the province, Speaker, from the many communities that have basic income uh, programs, uh, pilot programs running. But this Premier doesn't want to hear those stories, Speaker. He refuses to expect, uh, accept the fact, rather, that income security helps families out of poverty. That's what income security does. It helps people get out of poverty. It helps them and live healthier lives. It gives people hope, hope that they can actually have a life that gets better. That's what it does. Will the Premier admit that he shut down basic income before seeing the results because he doesn't want to see that it actually works? Premier. <laughs> yeah. Through you, Mr. Speaker, do you know what helps people like Tim? People like Tim. Oh, I, I forgot. People like Tim aren't allowed to have beer. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're right. Okay. What helps people like Tim is a good paying job. What helps people like Tim is reducing their hydro costs. 
What helps people like Tim is getting the economy going here, here, here. until once he gets a job and he does have a car, he'll have 10 cents a litre less when he goes to the gas pumps. I would like to ask the Leader of the Opposition through you, Mr. Speaker, where is she getting the $17 billion? Where is she getting the 17? I guess the same place they're getting when it comes to the highest carbon tax, the highest gas prices, the highest hydro rates. Guess what? There's only one person that pays the bills in Ontario, and that's the taxpayer. We're going to stand up for the people. Members will please take their seats. Start the clock. Final supplementary. Well, it may be information to this Premier, but um, some of the people on uh, the pilot project are actually recipients of Ontario Disability Support Program as well, Speaker. And I don't know whether they're going to be uh, having the opportunity to get the kind of jobs that Mr. Uh, uh, that the Premier is talking about. But what he should also recognize is this pilot project, Speaker, is about bringing information on which to make decisions. And I guess he doesn't want the facts. He doesn't want the information on which to make proper decisions because his, he's got the wrong priorities. This Premier has the wrong priorities, and we see it in decision after decision that he is making. He's choosing to put the health of students at risk just to please his radical social conservative friends. He's choosing to cut $330 million for mental health every year, making wait lists even longer. And now he's choosing to slash the social assistance increase, cancel the basic income program, and take money away from the most vulnerable people in Ontario. Why is the health and well-being of Ontarians so incredibly low on this Premier's priority list? Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, again, the Leader of the Opposition is too busy defending the win Liberals. We just had an election, and the people spoke loud and clear here in Ontario. They're tired of the policies of the win Liberals. They're tired of the NDP propping them up for the last 15 years. They're tired of having the largest debt, subnational debt, in the entire world. They're tired of paying $12 billion a year and servicing that debt. Mr. Speaker, just imagine how many people we could help if we didn't have to pay $12 billion a year in, in the debt. My friends, we're going to lower taxes. I know you don't like lowering taxes. We're going to lower gas prices. We're going to scrap the cap and trade, the reduced gas, gas prices by 10 cents a liter, and we're going to create great paying jobs. Members will take their seats. The House will come to order. The House will come to order. The House will come to order. Premier will come to order. The member for Niagara West will come to order. The member for Don Valley East will come to order. The member for Don Valley East will come to order. Restart the clock. Next question. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Speaker. <laughs> Speaker, my, my next question is also for the Premier. The Premier's plan to rip up the sexual health curriculum puts students at risk. That's according to parents educators and dozens of school boards across Ontario. And yesterday, nearly 1,800 healthcare professionals called on the Premier to restore the updated health curriculum in its entirety. Anything less will put children in harm's way and deny kids the information they deserve about consent, cyberbullying, gender identity, and same-sex families. Will the Premier finally do the right thing, listen to health care professionals, and restore the updated health curriculum for this September? Premier. For you, Mr. Speaker, to the Leader of the Opposition, I know the Leader of the Opposition wants to keep pounding away about the sex ed, but the Leader of the Opposition is forgetting about the most critical thing in education, 
or half our students are failing math. Half our students are failing math. We're going we're gonna to make sure our students aren't on the bottom tier. And by the way, Mr. Speaker, we have the lowest math scores in all of Canada. We're going to make sure that our, our students have the highest math scores in all of Canada. We're going to lift them up. Supplementary. By dragging students back to the 1998 curriculum, this Premier is scrubbing same-sex families, gender identity and consent out of our classrooms. And unfortunately, the Deputy Premier is playing along with the Premier's dangerous plan. She said that if kids want to talk about those issues, it won't happen in the classroom under the 1998 curriculum. It should happen in private, behind closed doors. Oh, Does the Premier there. agree with his Deputy Premier that questions about same-sex families, gender identity and consent should be put back in the closet instead of being welcomed in all of Ontario's classrooms? Premier. Mr. Of Education. Through you, to the Leader of the Opposition, I have to tell you that we are going to be listening this fall. I can't wait to go out and embark on the consultations that not only will touch on sex ed, but as the Premier just said, we're going to be listening in how we can move forward and prop our students up and prepare them for the realities of today and improve math office. scores, Great. for example. It, they should be absolutely hanging their heads that they do not agree with us that we need to improve math scores in this province. So I I can't wait, Speaker, will come to, order. to kick the off this comprehensive come consultation where, yes, we will be respecting parents and we'll be respecting people who want to raise their voice to help us put our students back on Response. a path to a successful career because we know over the last 15 years it went the opposite direction. Here, here, here. Stop the clock. Restart the clock. Next question. The member for Kitchener Conestoga. Mr. Speaker, my, uh, my question is for the, uh, the Minister of Finance, but before I ask my question, I'd like to wish him a happy birthday today. It was, it was truly heartening to see you, the Premier, and our government House Leader fulfilling yet another election campaign promise yesterday. This is truly a mark of a government for the people. I know that as, that as you have traveled across the province over the past weeks and month, months, you've been getting the same question over and over again. When are you bringing Buck of Beer back to Ontario? <laughs> Mr. Speaker, can the minister please tell the House more about, he, more about how he has been fulfilling this promise and saving money for the beer consumers of Ontario? Minister of Finance. Thank you very much, uh, Premier, and I want to uh, thank my fellow North Bayite for the question uh, on my 29th birthday. <laughs> All right. We uh, promised during the election campaign we would bring back Buck of Beer to Ontario, and starting this Labor Day weekend, we're going to deliver Buck of Beer to Ontario. <laughs> Speaker, promise made, promise kept. It was truly a pleasure to be with the Premier and the Government House Leader in his riding yesterday to launch the Premier's Buck of Beer Challenge. By encouraging competition in Ontario's brewing industry, opportunities will be created for value-priced beer products of money, and, in doing so, Your keep more money in the pockets of consumers. Uh, speaker, starting August 27th, brewers across Ontario will have the choice. Speaker, it's their choice to lower prices to a dollar for any beer under 5.6% alcohol volume. Supplementary. Uh, Mr. Speaker, back to the minister. I would like to thank the minister his, for his response. Uh, it is encouraging to hear that not only will Baca beer be in place for the Labor Day long weekend but that it may create new business opportunities for Ontario brewers as well. Under Premier Ford, Ontario is certainly open for business. It is hard to understand how the previous Liberal government banned Bucket Beer to the detriment of our consumers' choice and making people pay more for their beer. 
Mr. Speaker, can the minister please explain how it got to this point and why we need to bring Buck of Beer back to Ontario? Minister of Finance. Again, uh, thank you for the question. So let's review the actions of the previous government. Before 2008, Buck of Beer was popular with both consumers and brewers. Speaker, it was a win-win. The Liberals then added a layer of red tape when they raised the minimum beer price and made Buck of Beer illegal. That was bad for fostering competition, bad for the consumers who had to pay, pay price, uh, a larger price. But as of August 27th, Speaker, brewers will now have the choice to sell beer for a dollar again. This comes with no financial subsidy, Speaker. And let me stress once again, we are doing this smartly and responsibly. We will remain unwavering in our commitment to road safety and responsibility. Order. Speaker, we're going to trust consumers to make mature and responsible Pons. decisions, but there is zero tolerance for those who do not. We stop the clock again. Members will take their seats. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Spadina, Fort York. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. The connection between poverty and gun violence is indisputable. Today, community members and mothers of children injured or lost to gun violence came to Queen's Park to speak about how chronically low-income communities suffer from higher rates of violence and homicide. They want the Premier to take concrete steps towards alleviating poverty, beginning by reversing his cuts to social assistance and his cancellation of the basic income pilot. Will the Premier listen to those families who have first-hand lived experience and reverse his decisions? Premier. And social services. Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Yeah, so for the member for his question and the linkage and the importance it is for us to have a very serious conversation in this province about poverty. One in seven people live in poverty in this province, which is why we have decided to in ensure that we have a better system across all ministries to support those who are living uh, in vulnerable circumstances. For 15 years, we've had a patchwork, disjointed system that wasn't lifting people up. In fact, it was trapping them further, in, it was, it was the trapping them further into poverty. What we have said is we're going to pause the Liberal plan, raise rates across the board in social assistance by 1.5 per cent, and we will ethically and compassionately, with a lengthy runway, wind down the basic income program. But let me be perfectly clear. We take this issue very seriously. We're going to make life more affordable for all Ontarians, Spons. including those who are in vulnerable circumstances, and they will always have a champion in me. Thank you. Members, will please take your seats. Stop the clock. Restart the clock. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, we can only begin to tackle gun violence once we tackle poverty as its root cause. And people People in our communities are living in poverty because of already too low social assistance rates that keep them there. The people who came to speak today at Queen's Park are asking for respect for people with living in low incomes. They want to be consulted. Premier will come to order. Decisions. Leader of the opposition will come to order. They want to be consulted about Minister decisions Transportation will come that to impact order. them, such as the cut to social assistance and the cut, the cancellation of the basic income program. Will the premier put a stop to his cuts until he has properly consulted with those who are living in poverty in this province? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Again, I want to say thank you to the honourable member for his question. I don't agree with the premise. We are raising rates by 1.5 per cent across the board for social assistance in Ontario Works and Ontario Disability Support. We have said we will come back on November the 8th with a, a plan after 100 days of consultation. That's 93 days from now. We are making sure for the first time in 15 years that the people who are responsible for basic income, poverty reduction, ODSP and Ontario Works are sitting around the same table for the first First time in 15 years, so we can ensure that there is going to be a plan in place for Ontario's most vulnerable people so we can lift them up, get them a job if they can, and if they can't, we provide them with the best supports they possibly can. We want to make life more affordable for people. They want to continue with the broken system. I'm not having any of that. Stop the clock. 
Members will please take their seats. Restart the clock. Next question, the member for Flamborough Glanbrook. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Yesterday, our government for the people fulfilled yet another campaign promise, announcing that Bucket Beer will again be a reality in Ontario. Promise made? Promise kept. Effective August 27th, brewers right across Ontario will have the opportunity to sell beer for a dollar if they so choose. Naturally. Minister, I know you have long supported Ontario's brewing industry. Can you speak about why the Premier's challenge is such an important step forward? Here, here. Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Question this morning. You know, uh, yesterday I was really pleased to have the Premier and the Finance Minister in my home riding in Prince Edward County to make a very good news announcement for the people of Ontario. Yeah, yeah. You know, yesterday the Premier put out the challenge to every brewer, big and small, to lower their price of a beer to a dollar. Nobody's being forced, Mr. Speaker, to lower their prices. And I'm looking forward, and I know the Premier is looking forward to seeing which brewers take the plunge here on his challenge. It's our belief, it's our belief with our government that providing choice here, here. and competition results in benefits for, for consumers and people keeping more money in their pockets. You know, we were elected on a plan to reduce red tape. We were elected on a plan to put the people of Ontario first. We promised to bring Buck of Beer back to Ontario. And Mr. Speaker, I'm really happy to say we're lowering the cost of hydro, we're lowering the cost of gas, and we're lowering the cost of beer. <laughs> Start the clock. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Back to the minister. Not more than a decade ago, Bucca beer was a huge hit in Ontario, including in my hometown of Hamilton. Consumers and brewers alike loved it. They loved it in Hamilton. But then the Liberals and their friends wanted their cut, yeah. and they raised the minimum beer price in Ontario. It's too bad. They created another piece of red tape that actually made Bucca beer illegal. Oh. Minister, can you please tell the House Jenny's. how Bucca beer can be beneficial once again for both Ontario beer drinkers and Ontario brewers? Mr. Speaker, you know, it's been a busy summer for the new government here in Ontario. We've accomplished a lot already. Again, we've lowered the price of electricity. You know, we've got kids back to school at York University this fall, and we dealt with another campaign promise yesterday, making sure that we can lower the cost of beer to a buck of beer for the people of Ontario. It was an honour yesterday to have the Premier and the member from Nipissing, the birthday boy, uh, with me in Prince Edward County yesterday to announce that we're bringing back buck of beer. Our government encourages brewers to lower their prices to the newly reduced price floor through the Premier's Buck of Beer Challenge, effective August 27th. I'm proud to be a part of a government that's taking steps to allow people to keep more of their money. That's what we promised that they could do, keep more of their money, and we're delivering on that promise. And we're going to do this smartly and responsibly, Mr. Speaker. Our commitment to road safety is unwavering. We trust Ontario beer drinkers and other consumers to Make smart, mature, and Thank responsible choices. Thank you. <laughs> Members will take their seats. The Premier will come to order. The Premier will come to order. The Leader of the Opposition will come to order. I need to be able to hear the questions and the responses. Start the clock. Member for Temiskaming Cock. My question is to the Premier. Yesterday's announcement that the government will now be going into the beer subsidy business just shows how backwards this government's priorities are. Ontarians expect, order. Ontarians expect their government to get on with the hard work of making life better for families. I apologize to the member for Temiskaming Cock. The government side has to come to order. I can't hear him. Yeah. 
Member for Dismissal and Cochrane. That means making investments in mental health services, not slashing them by $335 million a year. That means fixing our crumbling schools, not cutting $100 million for school repairs. Why is this government choosing to spend public money to subsidize beer corporations while slashing planned social assistance increases for Ontario's most vulnerable citizens? Premier. Minutes. Uh, thank you very much. Well, um, first of all, there is no financial subsidy. I don't, I don't understand why the member doesn't take yes for an answer. We have told them that the bucket beer uh, is a simple change of the uh, Liberal law that increased the, the floor price to $1.25. We are reducing the floor price and allowing the beer companies simply to sell beer for a, a buck. Speaker, there's no sub, no financial subsidy Opposition for these companies. But what I can real tell you, Speaker, is that we're bringing real relief for families. This is yet another promise that's made for the people. This is one of the issues, Speaker, that I'll address in the uh, supplementary. Thank you. Supplementary, the member for Jamiskaminkov. Speaker. In what alternate universe is providing free advertising and premium shelf space not a subsidy? <laughs> the only brewery. come to order. The only brewers that can House afford to produce a bucket of dollar beer will be large multinational corporations who could lower quality access your government subsidies. That is putting Ontario's small and craft brewers at risk. They will now have to compete with cheap government subsidized beer. Why is this government spending public money to subsidize cheap beer at the expense of Ontario's craft brewers? Minister of Finance, response. You know, Speaker, I do not understand why the member cannot appreciate the fact that there is no subsidy in this. This is lowering the floor of the uh, beer prices from $1.25 to $1. They just will not take yes for an answer, Speaker. They just will not take yes for an answer. But what this government is also doing, Speaker, is lowering the uh, cap, uh, scrapping cap and trade, lowering the corporate tax from 11.5 to 10.5, lowering middle income, income tax, uh, taxes by 20 percent. We're cutting uh, hydro rates by 12 percent. Speaker, these are all of the issues that are meant to bring real relief and real prosperity the for the people. Or the speaker, this is a plan Bonds. for the people. If they don't want to, if the members of the opposition do not want to accept the facts, I realize the facts don't fit with this beautiful narrative, Speaker. Oh, Thank oh, you. Oh, oh, oh. Stop the clock. Restart the clock. The member for Don Valley East. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Um, recently, I had the opportunity to sit down with a group of young individuals who were receiving support from social services, and I asked them a question if they could change anything in relation to that program, what would it be? And I remember clearly a young man saying to me that he wished he could just member keep a Timmons little bit more of his money. He felt discouraged that if he burned, earned anything over 200, the government would take 50 percent of that, that money. So, Premier, you decided to cancel the planned earning exemption increase that would allow people on social assistance to earn $400 rather than the current $200. I believe that one of the best ways to get people back into the workforce is to provide incentive. Premier, why did you decide to cancel a program that would help people get back into the workforce? Premier. Minister of Community and Social Services. Minister of Children, Community Premier, and Social and, uh, Services. Thank the Honourable Member for his question. Uh, look, we chose a path a week ago today to hit the pause button on a, a disjointed patchwork set of policies by the previous administration. He is a previous minister and he would know that. What we have said instead is we are going to put forward a 1.5 per cent 
across-the-board increase in social assistance, and for we will, minutes. over the next Again, 93 days, it was 100 days last week, uh, come forward with a credible plan with all of the different people that were part of his former ministry and now part of mine, so that we can start to lift people up and we can ensure that they take home more of their hard-earned money and that, uh, that we, we, we increase their ability to get jobs. That's what our plan is about. Yeah. That's what we're going to do. We're going to restore dignity in the system. We're going to restore confidence in the system. Bonds. We're going to try and lift, lift those one in seven people that are living in poverty right now in the province of Ontario up. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Premier, this was another promise made and another promise broken by your minister. When you cancelled the basic income pilot, you sent a clear message to Ontarians. You sent a message that Doug Ford, sorry, the Premier, and the Conservatives are against better health outcomes, getting people back to work faster, and helping people find homes. Mr. Speaker, instead, of the, instead the government would rather use money to subsidize the Premier's very own partisan news channel. Mr. Speaker, can the minister explain why her party's minister? <laughs> <laughs> Government side will come to order. Stop the clock. Government side will come to order. Stop the clock. Restart. Member should put his question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister, can you explain why your party's talk is cheaper than your buck of beer? Response. Thank you very much, Speaker. I find it a bit rich that the member opposite, who used to be the Minister of Community and Social Services, would sit in this House today and ask a question on the basic income pilot project, because I'll tell you what my ministry told me yesterday. Not once did that member ask for a briefing on basic income security. Next question. The member for Thornhill. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And my pleasure to My question is to the Minister of Culture, Tourism and Sport. And I frequently get letters and phone calls in my riding of Thornhill from seniors. And when I first moved to Thornhill 30 years ago, it was mostly young families, but now we have so many great seniors living in our riding, and they're quite unaware of the initiatives to help them stay in shape. And um, I think that there's a lot more that we could do to help our seniors stay healthy, both physically and mentally, Mr. Speaker. Could the minister share with us what programs are in place to keep all the great seniors in all of our ridings healthy and engaged? Good. Minister of Tourism. Thank you, Speaker. To my friend and colleague, thank you for the, the question. I'm pleased to share an initiative that is led by my colleague, the Minister of Seniors Affairs and Accessibility. Our government has a number of initiatives and public education efforts to improve the quality of life for Ontario seniors. One of these is a province-wide active living fairs. Active living fairs bring seniors and caregivers together to connect and learn key issues that affect their health and well-being. They also share information about available supports and programs. Fairs occur in senior centres and including rural, francophone and Indigenous seniors. 
This year, 70 active living fairs and six regional workshops will be delivered through a partnership with the Older Ontario Adult Centres Association of Ontario. I encourage you to visit oacao.org to visit a find a seniors fair near you. Member for Thornhill, supplementary. Thank you, and again to the minister. And I want to really thank the minister for all this information. And I know many seniors in my riding are an anxious to take part in many of the programs, like the active Absolutely. living fairs yeah. that were just described. However, I'm sure all members of the House would agree with me when I say that there's a lot more that we can do in order to support all the great seniors all across our province of Ontario. Could the minister tell us what else is being done to promote activities that help keep our seniors active and reduce social isolation? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Minister. To speaker. Through the Ontario Sport and Rec Fund, we are supporting 45 projects through Active for Life Recreation. These programs give seniors more opportunity to stay fit and connected in their communities. Just recently, the Muskoka Lawn Bowling Club was awarded funding through this program to expand their lawn bowling program for seniors. Another program that promotes active living for seniors is the Ontario Seniors Games. The Ontario 55 Plus Games is a celebration of active living hosted throughout the year, alternating between winter and summer. This coming weekend, 1,400 participants from across Ontario will come to Mississauga to participate in the Ontario 55 Plus Games. I'd like to wish all the competitors all the best of luck at the Games this weekend. These are just a few examples of some of the ways that our government is encouraging active, healthy living Spons. for seniors across Ontario. The member for Hamilton Mountain. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. The Minister acts as if all that's needed for basic income pilot participants is to pull themselves up by their bootstraps and they'll be set. But many of those participants were on long-term disability, unable to work like other Ontarians. And that will still be true the day after this minister ends the basic income pilot. The Income Security Roadmap recommended a 5% increase to ODSP. The previous government committed to 3%, but this government slashed even that in half. Today, I will be tabling a motion calling on the government to reverse this wrong-headed decision. Will the minister do the right thing, support my motion, stop the cuts to social assistance, and reverse the decision to cancel the basic income pilot project? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thanks, uh Thanks very much to the member for her question. I'll look forward to uh, seeing what the motion actually stands for, but I guess I have to once again reject the premise of the question because we have not slashed anything. We are coming forward with a 1.5 per cent cross-the-board increase yeah. September 1st. We've also said that we will compassionately, in a lengthy time frame, um, uh, wind down the basic income pilot project. Um, but I just wanted to point out that to begin with, the basic income uh, research project is uh, failing, and, and it's plain and simple. The Liberal government had difficulty signing people up for this approach. Um, now a sizable number, over 25 per cent, have either dropped out or were failing to meet their obligations, such as filing their taxes. And it calls into question whether the $150 million being spent is actually going to be uh, with valid research. And, Speaker, where I come from, $150 million is a lot of money. So what we want to do is in 100 days, 93 days, come back with a plan that will lift more people up and support those who need it most. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, David Cherkowski had been on disability benefits for 15 years due to mental illness, where he, as he put it, barely survived. Then he joined the basic income pilot. David was able to buy fresh fruit, find affordable housing, and even looking to start a co-op for people with disabilities. Without the basic income, those basic, like fresh fruit, those plans, like the co-op, are gone, replaced with a cut by half of the scheduled 3 percent increase to disability benefits that David was barely surviving on. What does the minister have to say to David? Minister. Thanks very much to the member opposite. I uh, would like to say to David, we want to hear him. We want to hear his stories. We want to see how we can best support him when we come forward with our plan in 93 days. But I, I again reject the premise. 
There is no slash. There is no cut. It is a 1.5 per cent increase across the board. We are hitting the pause button on a disjointed, fragmented approach that was taken by the previous Liberal government, and we're going to make sure that all of the various uh, areas within my ministry are talking to one another for the first 15 years, uh, first time in 15 years, so we can have better outcomes for people like David. And my staff are in the galleries today. If anyone that is on the Basic Income Pilot Project wants to speak with them, uh, we're happy to do that. We want to hear their stories. But let me be perfectly clear. What the member opposite actually wants is a $17 billion program that would increase the HST Pots. by 7%. 20% HST in the province of Ontario would damage the people of this province further. Thank you. Next question, member from Mississauga, Erin Mills. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Attorney General. Last week, the government announced its intentions to take the next step in its fight against the federal government's plan to impose an affordable ta carbon tax on the people of Ontario. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I can't tell you how pleased I was to see Minister and her colleagues stand and announce that the, our government will be seeking an opinion from the Ontario Court of Appeal on whether or not the federal carbon tax is unconstitutional in whole or in part. I know that the people of my riding who have felt the burden of the Liberal taxes for far too long that this is a welcome news. I also know that the last month, the Premier announced that Ontario will be supporting Saskatchewan Challenge of the federal carbon tax in their own court of appeal. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Attorney General, can, can she tell us, the House, why Ontario launching a separate challenge? And Thank, you. Thank you. The Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to answer the member's question. Our government was given a mandate by the people of Ontario to make life more affordable and to stand up for what matters to them. And this means challenging the Trudeau Liberals' carbon tax. Here, here. And we are using every tool available to us to do so. By participating in both our own Court of Appeal challenge and supporting Saskatchewan's challenge, we are working in tandem to ensure that both challenges proceed efficiently and affordably while allowing the courts to the ability to consider all arguments regarding the validity of the federal carbon tax. As I said yesterday, Mr. Speaker, anywhere the carbon tax is being challenged, we want to be part of that fight. Our aim is simple, Mr. Speaker, but will mean a great deal for the people who have struggled under Liberal taxes for more Spons. than a decade. We want to see money put back in the pockets of taxpayers and deliver real tax relief for Ontario families and small businesses. Supplementary. It's clear to me, Mr. Speaker, that the government is taking its commitment to the people of Ontario very seriously. I know the people of my riding will be pleased to know that their government is working hard on their behalf, and I know that they will be even more pleased when we win this Members challenge for them. Come to order. Mr. Speaker, we know that the federal government is already having second thoughts about their carbon tax, evidenced by news reports last week that they were scaling back the scope of it. This is certainly heartening news for provinces opposing to this unaffordable tax, which is why, Mr. Speaker, I'm wondering if the minister can speak a bit about what happens if other provinces would like to join our challenge and what our basis is in filing it. Thank you. Response. Mr. Speaker, I thank the member for the supplementary question. As the Attorney General, I wouldn't bring forward a case that I didn't have confidence in. Yes. Yes. And I also hope that it serves as an inspiration to others who may also be questioning, questioning the validity of the Trudeau Liberals' carbon tax. In filing our challenge, Mr. Speaker, Ontario's position is clear. This is an unconstitutional tax that will do nothing but drive up the, good, the cost of goods and services that Ontarians rely on every day. And by putting forward this challenge, we are working hard to stand up for the people of Ontario and make life more affordable in this province again. While it is up to the courts to decide who may participate in Ontario's challenge, it is our commitment that anywhere the federal carbon tax is being challenged, we want to be part Spons. of that. Member
restart the clock. The member for Key Wetanong. Speaker, uh, my question is to the Minister of uh, Indigenous Affairs. Uh, the people of Grassy Narrows and uh, Wabasamunk, uh, first peoples of this land, have reached an agreement uh, with the provincial government. Uh, $85 million uh, was put in trust to go toward cleaning the river uh, of the mercury that has been poisoning the people in these communities. Uh, the Premier, uh, during the campaign, uh, said that his government would clean up the river and the land as quickly as possible and ensure everyone uh, gets high quality care. What has the government done to fill this commitment? Thank you. Of Indigenous Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for his question. Every Ontario resident deserves to have access to safe, clean drinking water. We will work closely with those Indigenous communities, Grassy Narrows and Wabsimung, two communities I'm intimately familiar with, and the opportunity to, uh, to correct that wrong, Mr. Speaker. We will also be working and challenging our federal government partners to make sure that those two communities have safe drinking water. The federal government must step up to ensure this. But every Ontario resident can count on this government to that commitment, Mr. Speaker. As a member of provincial parliament for Grassy Narrows and uh, Wab Simung uh, should know, I've been involved in this file for a very long time, Mr. Sp uh, Mr. Speaker. We take it very seriously and we hope to protect, defend, Leader and the deliver, Mr. Speaker, a solution for these two communities. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the, uh, the Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Um, when a promise is made to First Nations people, the people of the First Peoples of this land, it has to be kept. Uh, when, uh, what contact has the Premier made with the Chief and Council of Grassy Narrows and Wabasamuk? What, uh, what can they expect to clean, uh, expect a cleanup of the river and the land of the mercury contamination? Will the Premier, as the new Democrats had committed, have uh, contribute to a mercury treatment center for the people in these communities? Miigwech. Minister. Mr. Speaker, as I previously stated, we're committed to safe, clean drinking water uh, in those two communities, as we are for every community across Ontario, Mr. Speaker. We're also committed to ensuring that those two communities have the same kind of economic opportunities moving forward as other communities. There's mining exploration activities immediately in the region, Mr. Speaker. And we, we want those communities to have increased prosperity, to have access to jobs, Mr. Speaker, to have access to the kinds of things that many other Ontarians have come to expect. Exactly. Moving forward, Mr. Speaker, I can assure this member I've met with senior officials in my department. We've discussed the opportunity here to, to correct and fix that problem, Mr. Speaker. We're committed to it for the benefit not only of those communities, but the people in our vast and beautiful region of Kenora Rainy River. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Thank you. Next question, the member for Durham. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. We heard over and over again on the campaign trail for the last year that businesses and families did not want the Liberals' cap-and-trade scheme. The Liberals said their cap-and-trade scheme collected dollars from Ontarians that would spawn a new economy. Speaker, as our government winds down the cap-and-trade program, the Vice President of Corporate Strategy of Toyota had some choice parting words for the program. He said, quote, if you build up consumer demand solely based on how many thousands of dollars the government can give you to encourage you to buy a car, that to me doesn't sound like a terribly sustainable business model, end quote. Speaker, we couldn't agree more with his assessment. Can the Minister of the Environment confirm to this House that the days of the cap-and-trade scheme stifling the businesses of Ontario is over? Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. 
Through you, Mr. Speaker, thank you to the member from Durham. Um, she puts a great deal of time and effort into supporting her constituents, and this is just one example. As Bill 4 is debated in this, uh, in this House uh, this week, I'd also like to thank the members from Carleton, Kitchener-Conestoga, Ottawa West Nepean, and uh, Mississauga Malton, who are speaking on behalf of their constituents about this job-killing bill. We know now that the cap-and-trade carbon tax was a job killer, and we know that it did very little to affect greenhouse gas emissions. The Auditor General had stated that it would cost Ontario consumers over $8 billion and do very little to, uh, to assist in reducing emissions, which is why I know that Ontarians support getting rid of this job-killing tax. In addition to saving families money, um, as the member mentioned, uh, job creators are making it clear that it is good for them and that's good for their competition, good for jobs in Ontario. And it's anticipated that the cancellation of the cap and trade carbon Lots. tax and our gas tax cut will mean 14,000 new jobs for Ontario. Wow. This legislation is great news for Ontario and Ontario. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the member for Durham. Speaker, I thank the minister through you for his answer. Still to him, we know that getting rid of the Liberals' cap-and-trade scheme is only part of the picture. That's because the federal government still seems content with charging ahead with their own plan to impose their carbon tax on the people of Ontario. Speaker, while the National Post proclaimed the Liberals were in retreat over their climate plan and the Toronto Star wrote that Trudeau and his ministers are busy managing what looks like a big climb down, the threat of the federal Liberals' carbon tax is still very real. Speaker, Ontarians have not asked us to get rid of the cap-and-trade scheme only to have a carbon tax forced on them by another level of government. Can the Minister of the Environment tell this legislature what he's doing to ensure the people Thank of you. Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Mr. Speaker, uh, through you to the member, last week uh, my colleague, the Attorney General, announced that we would be using the courts. Um, we have made it clear that this government will do everything in its power to, uh, to stop the Trudeau government carbon tax. We promised the people of Ontario we'd take immediate action on, on cutting gas prices, on helping job creators, and that's what we're doing. Uh, Mr. Speaker, in today's National Post, a fine publication, um, the, the president, president fellow at the University of Calgary School of Public Policy, Jack Mintz, wrote, despite the appeal among many policy elites, policy elites, Mr. Speaker, for carbon taxation, carbon ta taxation does not satisfy the smell test for voters. Mr. Speaker, we know that. We know that, and we know that, uh, that the voters have given us a strong mandate as a result of that. So I repeat, this government will do everything in its power to stop the Trudeau carbon tax. We know it's not Response. good for jobs. We know it's not good for families. That's why we're fighting it, and we're going to win. Restart the clock. Next question. The member for Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Premier. Did the Premier directly or indirectly attempt to recruit or encourage anyone to run against Patrick Brown for Peel Regional Chair prior to cancelling the election? Municipal Affairs. Premier, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Ah. Thanks uh, very much, Speaker, and through you to the member again. Two days in a row, and I'm, I'm very disappointed in this experienced member for the tone of his question Absolutely. And, and the content. <laughs> we made it very clear with the uh, Better Local Government Act that we were going to make some changes. We were going to make some changes. Yeah. Yes, the question has to be about government policy. And I would ask the member for a supplementary relating to government policy. Thank you, Speaker. Again, to the Premier, were, were there steps taken before he put this policy forward that would have shaped that election? Did he bring forward the cancellation of the election because he did not like those who were running in it? Essentially the same question. We'll move on. Next question, the member for Bruce Gray Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Energy, Northern Development, Mines and Indigenous Affairs. Ontario is a leader in mineral exploration and production. 
In fact, Toronto is the mining finance capital of the world, with 2017 alone increasing revenues of $8.5 billion in new equity capital for mining, according to the Toronto Stock Exchange. Later this week, the minister will be attending the 2018 Energy and Mines Ministers' Conference in Iqaluit, Nunavut. Can the minister explain how the mining industry will continue to attract investments in Ontario and how the minister's conference will help highlight Ontario's leadership in this crucial sector? Good. Minister of Energy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. What a timely and pertinent question from the member for Bruce Owen Gray and Sound. I'm looking so forward to going up to Callaway to want for finally perhaps in the first time in a generation, celebrate the Ontario advantage that we see just on the horizon here, here. and how it's going to positively affect Ontario's mining sector. Ontario is a world leader in mineral, mineral exploration, development and production, and we seek to re-establish Ontario's energy advantage that once made us a proud economic engine of this country and support real mining activity, Mr. Speaker. He's right. Toronto is the undisputed finance capital of the world when it comes to mining. $9.9 billion worth of minerals. 22% of Canada's total mineral production occurs right here in Ontario. Currently, Ontario expenditures are approximately $526 million. But the confidence from investors in this government's plan for Ontario will see that rise to more than $600 million. That's good. Thank you. Question. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for his leadership on this file. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Further to my last question, Mr. Speaker, the mining sector is also a significant employer in our province. This government has committed to creating and protecting good jobs across Ontario and sending the message that our province is open for business by lowering taxes and cutting job-killing red tape. Yeah, yeah. Considering that around 25 per cent of all mining jobs in Canada are based in Ontario, can the minister explain the leadership role the mining industry is playing in creating and protecting jobs in Ontario? Sure. Minister. The, the member can be assured that when I get up to Acala, we're going to be talking about creating jobs in, mining, in Ontario's mining opportunity. And Mr. Speaker, we're open for business. Mineral production and exploration in Ontario supports more than 26,000 direct jobs and 50,000 indirect jobs. 25 per cent of mining jobs in Canada are right here in this beautiful province, and about two-thirds of those jobs are in northern Ontario. We share a passion for the opportunity for Indigenous communities and municipalities and the province to benefit from this opportunity, Mr. Speaker. In fairness, it's been a tough couple of weeks for the SPEND DP on this part for the mining sector, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Hydro One leadership renewed, Mr. Speaker. Promise made. Promise Scrapping the crap and trade uh, carbon tax, Mr. Speaker. Promise made. Promise Putting York University students back in school for a modern workforce to support mining. Promise made. Promise made. Promise Members will take their seats. The House will come to order. There's still time on the clock. The House will come to order. Next question. Start the clock. Member for Essex. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Speaker, the Toronto municipal election isn't the Premier's first election interference rodeo. During the election, the provincial election, a tape came to light of the Premier offering to buy memberships in Etobicoke Centre and promising people that they wouldn't even have to show up and vote at a nomination meeting. Wow. Something in direct violation of PC party rules and a clear attempt to circumvent his own party's democratic rules. Shame. The Premier promised an investigation into allegations of election fraud. Speaker, has the investigation been completed and will the findings be made public? Premier. Speaker, I want to thank the member for the question. Our priority in this House is the Better Local Government Act. We made it very clear when I tabled that bill how we were going to make changes to both the City of Toronto elections and the regional elections in, in Niagara, exactly. uh, York, Peel, and, and Muskoka. You know, we, we made it very clear during the campaign Crystal. that we were going to reduce the size and the cost of government. We were going to make government work more accountable with more trust. And that's exactly, Speaker, exactly what the Better Local Government Act is doing. We're going to continue to debate that bill. We again encourage the uh, members in the opposition benches to talk about making government more effective and more efficient rather than the drive-by smears. Yeah.
Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. There are 124 ridings in Ontario, but there's only one riding so far where the Premier appears to be breaking the rules to interfere in his party's democratic nomination process. Speaker, were there any ridings where the Premier offered to pay for memberships or tried to manipulate the outcome of the nomination? Or was Etobicoke Centre did Etobicoke Centre have a special place in the Premier's heart? Again, Speaker, through you to the member. I'm going to speak about government policy. I'm going to speak about government policy. You know what, Speaker? People in the opposition benches, people in the NDP, they want to forget about the referendum that took place on June 7th. Yeah. The referendum where the people of Ontario gave Premier Doug Ford and our party a clear mandate to govern, Crystal a clear, clear mandate to make efficient and effective government. I take no lessons from the Democrats about open and accessible government. I'm going to stand with Premier Ford. There being no deferred votes, this House stands in recess until 1 o'clock.